speaker is uh, Professor O'Sullivan. And um, we actually ran into each other in the train one time. <laughs> so that's when I first met him. I looked at what he was uh, working on. We were sitting next to each other, and we, s we suddenly discovered we were roughly in the same area. So and it's very good, uh, very good to greet you here again. And I, I noticed your, your Minsky button. Oh, you yes, button. Yes, indeed. Um, so uh, Professor Sullivan is the director of the Insight Center for Data Analytics. Uh, and uh, he's a professor of computer science at UCC. He leads a very large research group uh, in the area of artificial intelligence, and he's going to tell us more about that. Thank Great, you. Thank you. So um, thanks, uh, Gloria, for that introduction. Um, so I, I want to give you a sense of George Bull's legacy in computer science, and I suppose in particular artificial intelligence, and later on in big data. I'll give you a sense of the, um, <clears throat> the opportunities that are there, um, as well as the legacy. Um, so I've um, titled this uh, From Boolean Satisfiabilities to Sustainable Development because this is the, um, this in my field are probably the most significant things that he had an impact on. Of course, he had many other impacts, but these were, these are the two that are close to my heart. Um, so, and I suppose in the laws of thought, there's this quote, um, which I'll let you read. Um, in a sense, what's What's kind of what's really interesting is that when you um, you know yesterday there was a, a, a very lovely celebration of Marvin Minsky's life, um, and um, uh, just over the last few days I've been looking at connections between Marvin Minsky, Claude Shannon, and George Boole, and they're quite significantly all over the place. You know it, it, they're very very closely related, um, and I'll just mention those uh, going through. So he he was in search of what the of what was fundamentally the key to um, human intelligence. Now, Michael mentioned that he's related to um, Jeffrey Hinton, who's the uh, great great grandson, who's leading the deep mind work, the, the deep learning work at Google. And um, it would have been very interesting to have the two of them in the same room because Jeff would believe that uh, the approach that um, that George Bull took was quite um, may not have been exactly the correct approach to take, that human intelligence is based on pattern matching and recognizing patterns, um, which is only partly true, I think. So it would be very interesting to hear that debate, but unfortunately, we, we obviously never will. Um, the Laws of Thought was, the, um, was his magnum opus. Um, and every computer science student in the world sort of knows it uh, as this kind of stuff that you see in a first year computer science um, course. Um, to AI people, um, we, um, we see this as the mechanism that um, helps us understand the reasoning of intelligent beings, uh, what we use to um, make this, to model, um, to do knowledge representation, to do reasoning over knowledge representations. Um, and of course, um, this is a kind of a, a fun um, picture, but uh, you know, obviously the field of robotics and the field of problem solving and so on, and AI, or a huge amount of George Boole. And what's interesting in this particular photograph is that um, coming back to Claude Shannon, Claude Shannon did um, work quite a lot on the Rubik's Cube. Uh, he, had, uh, he was famous for his uh, funny poems about the uh, Rubik's Cube. Um, and of course, um, we've all seen in the last couple of weeks that, um, that Go has been, um, that the human beings are now second to the machine um, on Go. Um, and what's interesting here is that Claude Shannon, of course, built one of the very, very first um, uh, mechanical, I suppose, AI-based chess playing machines. Um, now, just to comment on this, um, there's a lot of hyperbole at the moment about this sort of representing the end of humanity as we know it, because uh, killer robots are going to come and take over the world because they're so intelligent now. But um, I don't think that's quite true. So. Um, this is the cover of uh, Claude Shannon's um, MSc thesis, uh, stamped there, as 1940, with the MIT library stamp. Um, and in that, um, the, uh, this is widely considered to be the most famous MSc thesis ever written. Um, and there's a table in there, table, table, table one on page 11, that sort of maps out very, very simply what the connections were between Boolean algebra and the kind of switching circuit work that uh, he did. Now, I, at this point, I was hoping to show you a clip of Marvin Minsky speaking about Claude Shannon and this dissertation, but uh, unfortunately, the technology let us down. Um, but I'd encourage you uh, to Google that and uh, have a listen. It's a, it's a fascinating clip. Um, um, but going back to you know, CS 101, um, where did Claude Shannon's work leave us? Well, it, it left us with um, an approach to building very simple 
a, a very simple, elegant approach to building circuits. So um, these are the standard logic gates that you'll find um, in you know, the second week of CS101. Um, and from these, we can build um, circuits that add. So we can build full adder circuits, very, very easy kind of things to build. Um, if you're not a computer science person, you just 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 believe me that this is what it does, right? <laughs> so, um, and if you don't, we can talk about it at a coffee break while Michael's getting this three million from somebody. So the um, uh, we can build circuits that compare numbers. We can build circuits that select. We can build CPUs. And what's what's very interesting is that this is just about the manipulation of this two-valued logic that that um, Boole uh, started working on, obviously, in The Laws of Thought, and which uh, Claude Shannon, in some sense, blew the dust from the work of Boole and turned it into something that could be operationalized. Um, and that was, the, that was the genius in that MSE thesis. But um, just coming back to the, um, the reasoning of, uh, you know, to reasoning and to AI and to Boole's legacy, I suppose um, I want to talk a little bit about Boolean satisfiability, which some of you probably know a lot about and some of you don't. So for those of you who know a lot about it, I apologize. I'm going to be uh, taking you through something that's um, very, very familiar. But some of you will, have, will see this for the first time. And I suppose over the next couple of slides, the background to this work is actually that it, um, is that it raises one of the most significant problems in computer science, which is deciding whether is a famous p equals mp question. Um, so I'll talk about that as we, as we go along. But basically, um, um, what is Boolean satisfiability? Well, this is just a way of modeling uh, computation problems by identifying a set of variables which take true or false as our value. Um, to constrain these things, so imagine you're um, trying to figure out whether a, whether a, a system is behaving properly or, or, has, or has bugs, so you're doing some what's called hardware software verification, then you would model the system by saying what the relationships between these variables are. And you would do that through what we call clauses. And typically in Boolean satisfiability, you have um, clauses that are conjunction or disjunctions, so R's of um, at, um, logical atoms of their negations, and you have a conjunction of these. So basically, on the bottom right-hand side here, we have a, a typical kind of formula that the task is to figure out, does, is, does, does that evaluate the true or does that evaluate the false? So are, is there a setting of the variables A to, um, to D in this example that, allowed, that, that will allow us to satisfy this um, this formula. And why is that significant? It's significant because there are lots of systems that we might want to model in this way, we might want to verify them in this way, and we have very, very fast technology that allows us to, to do this very, very quickly. And I suppose some of you are probably figuring out, well, you know, what should, should A be true or false? Should B be true or false? And that's actually, in general, an extremely difficult problem. Um, what's a very easy problem is that if I tell you, if I propose to you some values and I ask you, well, is the formula true, then you can just read through the formula and you can tell if it is or not. So here, for example, I'm going to set A to false, B to true, C to false, and D to false. And we can just walk through this, this formula and check if it's true or not. So um, by setting D to false, um, we satisfy this first clause. Uh, by setting, uh, it also satisfies the second clause. By setting B to true, we satisfy the third clause. By, satisfy, by setting A to false, we satisfy the fourth clause. And by setting C to false, we satisfy the last clause. And we can just tell that by, by walking through the formula. And what's very, very interesting is that one of the biggest questions in computer science is whether doing the checking is as easy as doing the generating. Right? This is the P versus MP question. Um, and we know that we can check things easily, but you know, can we, you know, if, if I don't give, if we're back at this point and I say, well, is it satisfiable or not? We believe in computer science that you always have to search, right? So, um, and if you can solve that question, so if you can prove that either, no, you don't always have to search, or yes, you do always have to search. So once you come up with the true or the false for the P equals MP question, then that solves one of the Millennium Prizes, which comes with uh, prize, uh, prize money of about a million dollars, I think. So, um, and that gets us, you know, halfway through the house. So only a small task. We just, once we've solved the P equals MP question, then uh, we'll, have, we'll, have our, we'll have a good old fund for the for the property. So how do we do this? So, it, so what we've developed in computer science are SAT solvers, and how, and how they work is they search. So, um, 
So for example, and it's nothing more than, well, we'll try a value and see how, uh, and see how we do. So for example, we'll set a, to fall, uh, set a to true here. As a consequence of the first clause, that means that we have to set the, that b is set to false. We make another decision, so we set c to be true. That allows us to make some further deductions. And so set solvers are highly optimized to, make the, to propagate the consequences of these decisions. And we keep on going. And more often than not, the guesses, that we the guesses that we try don't work and we fail. And so at that point, the simple thing to do is just, well, revisit your decisions and, and carry on. But in set solving, um, there's a lot of interesting, interesting technology for figuring out why did we fail and can we learn from that? And reasoning about, well, what is it that we did wrong and let's make sure that we never do it again. And this is clause learning. And so there's a lot of work in clause learning. So I'll just move along. So, these, so when we learn something, we add it to the base and we keep on going. But this is the most, this gets to the core of computer science. So, you know, often, um, so through my work at Insight, one of the things I do a lot is engage with policymakers. And they often, some of the questions, if, if someone's not from your area, the question they ask you is, what is the big question in field X, right? So um, the people who are curing cancer can answer that question, we're trying to cure cancer, right? So, um, and in computer science, for my money, the problem that we're trying to solve is this one, right? So I know that many computer scientists in the room might disagree, but for me, this is the, this is the key question because there's a, lot that we, there's a lot of things that we rely on in the world in security and so on and cryptography that rely on these things not being true. Um, we had Donald Knuth visit UCC recently and over coffee, he believes that P does equal MP um, and gave uh, an extremely eloquent um, justification that you know, only Don Knuth can do uh, to why, that, why he really believes that. But of course, in general, we've moved on from, um, th there are other technologies for solving these sorts of problems. So there's constraint programming, there's linear programming, there's all these sorts of things. And usually we're not interested in finding a single satisfying assignment, but we wish to find the best assignment. So we're scheduling um, for uh, FedEx, you know, so underneath there is a Boolean satisfiability problem, but we have a preference over which solutions we want to get. And so, we, so, um, so all of these things are, in principle, equally expressive, um, but they're just operationally different. Um, so when you talk to a person in operations research, um, what they're doing is a form of reasoning which has its roots in Boole's work. Um, so just kind of some of the kind of things we can do, and we've solved some of these problems ourselves. So um, just to make it practical, so this is a part of the problem of treating cancer patients with intensity modulated radiotherapy. So um, I'm not sure whether you've ever seen one of these machines, hopefully not. Um, but if you do, then um, the physician wants to give you, wants to, wants to irradiate the tumor in different ways. And so there's a treatment, there's a, he, he might want the, the machine to sort of move around your body and for a, for a certain amount of time. Um, and essentially at each step, um, there's, a, there's a collimator on the front of this machine, so little sliding windows, if you wish, that allow the operator to deliver a certain amount of radiation. And so the problem of figuring out how do you set this machine is fundamentally a Boolean optimization problem. And so um, not just because it has a whole bunch of ones and zeros in it, but because the most efficient techniques for solving this are actually what are called partial weighted max set techniques. And these are techniques that come from, um, that are directly, you can, you can find this kind of stuff already in the, the laws of thought. So um, another interesting problem is, uh, in, again, in this field, and this is probably the least offensive picture I could find of, um, of, um, of, uh, of prostate cancer treatment. Um, but here we're, we're using brachytherapy, which is the insertion of very, very tiny um, uh, radioactive seeds into a tumor. And um, unlike, unlike the previous radiotherapy where you're beaming it in from the outside, this is where you're implanting the, th the radiation into the tumor itself. And the Boolean optimization problem, underpinning this, um, involves um, just essentially two mathematical statements. So you want to, um, so how does this work? This work, you're given a three-dimensional um, uh, dosage matrix of upper and lower bounds for every voxel of the tumor you have a three-dimensional, a corresponding three-dimensional um, matrix of Boolean variables where 
the voxel is true if you're placing a radioactive seed in that voxel and zero otherwise. And because, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. And because, these, because this is radiation, um, every time you put a seed into this tumor, it treats the entirety of the, of the tissue. And so all this little statement is saying is that the, um, is that the, the cell of the tumor, that's, the, the amount of treatment, the amount of exposure that that cell is getting is just a sum of everything around it. And the, the, the amount of radiation is um, reducing according to an inverse square law, depending on where you put it. So the further away uh, part of the tissue is from where you put the seeds, and obviously the um, uh, significantly less um, treatment has been given. And um, there's just simply a constraint that says you want, to make, you want to maximize the number of parts of this tumor that achieve the correct um, treatment plan. Very, very simple Boolean model for this problem. Um, and after that, it's down to laws of thought of how you solve these kinds of problems. So what do you put into these solvers in order to operationalize and reason about these kinds of models? And this kind of stuff revolutionized health. It can, has the potential to revolutionize health. Another problem I'm going to talk about very, very briefly, just because it's so large, a problem that we solved um, about four years ago was the, um, the energy planning problem for France. And this is a problem. So in the French EDF system, they have um, 56 nuclear power stations, well, they had at that time, and about 20 coal power plants. And they had to plan how they're going to operationalize that entire, that entire capability over um, a certain period of time in order to deliver adequate power to the, to the country. And um, you know, this is a very, very large problem, you know, 6,000 time steps, because it's highly uncertain. And again, Boole was one of the guys that introduced um, you know, reasonable probabilities into computer science. Um, we're optimizing here under you know, over 120 different stochastic scenarios. And just to represent a single solution for this problem, it, ta it takes about 50 million decision variables. So that's an enormous optimization problem. So people think, you know, when they think of things like satisfiability, they think of you know, thousands and maybe tens of thousands of variables. We're far beyond that now. We're in the millions or tens of millions of variables. And for those of you who haven't fallen asleep yet, you might be asking, well, what about this P equals MP problem? What, doesn't that bite you at this point? And what's interesting is that it doesn't. Um, so we're, we can solve problems, we can solve Boolean problems now that, are, that have more states in them than there are atoms in the universe. Right, absolutely vast size problems. And the reason for this is that the world is an optimizer, nature is an optimizer, so, so problems are highly, problems that you experience from the real world are highly structured and you can exploit the structure. And so I'm just gonna briefly explain two aspects of the structure that have revolutionized Boolean satisfiability solving. So one is um, sort, of an odd, sort of an odd observation that I, uh, when people observed initially thought that this was some sort of mistake. And so this is, Imagine you take a, an industrial Boolean satisfiability problem and you run a set solver on it and you measure the amount of time it takes and then you run it again and you measure the time it takes and you compute the average of those two times and you keep on doing that so you're building up the cumulative average. Intuitively, you might expect that you know, after 100 or 1,000 runs that this thing sort of you know, steady states out, but it doesn't because lots of real world problems have what are called heavy tail runtime distributions. Their means and variance tend to infinity and their median runtime tends to one. And this was something that people never really thought to be something that was possible. That you know, these problems, the complexity of these problems grew with the, with the size of them and that was everything that, the, that determined their runtime. So, but there's a, there's a very basic strategy, along with the sort of things I, I spoke about earlier, called random restarts, which, seems, which is a very, very simple idea, which is if, if you seem to be working on, if your stat solver seems to be working on this problem for a little bit, for a long time, then stop and just try again. Because most stat solvers have randomization in them. And if the, if the runtime distribution is one where the median is tending to a very low number, but the average is very, very high, then you want to exploit that, that heaviness in the tail and just simply stop and guess again. And that has completely revolutionized the SAT solving industry. And that is why we can solve problems like the one from EDF involving 50, 60 million decision variables. Um, we should not be allowed to solve, we should not, it should not be possible to solve problems of that size. Um, the other thing that's interesting is that structure, um, most of these kinds of problems that we experience, they have very, while they're huge, there, are, there, are, there is a very small number of key decisions you need to make. 
Um, unfortunately, we don't know what those decisions are. So this is the whole theory of backdoor variables, backdoor key variables, insatisfiability. But the point is that there's a very tiny number of variables, a tiny, tiny fraction of the total problem. And if you could find those variables and if you could, if you could set them correctly, these are the only ones you're ever going to search over. Um, and here again, by simply stopping and starting again, you increase the likelihood that you will actually, um, that you will encounter those. And you can rigorously prove the expected running time based on these, uh, on these aspects, which is, which is fantastic. I suppose just moving quickly to the last part of the talk, um, we've all heard of the hype of big data and, uh, and data analytics. And I think Boole's work has a significant, um, has a significant legacy already in there. I've only spoken about Boole from the point of view of optimization and satisfiability, but he's also had a huge impact in terms of machine learning and data mining um, and the, the, the rigorous study of those fields. So, um, but big data, so data analytics problems are typically very, very large. So the fact that we can solve very large optimization problems is good news. Machine learning people can, uh, can deal with vast corpuses of data. So I suppose in insight, we see data analytics as following these sort of three different um, uh, dimensions. There's descriptive analytics, which is explaining what's happened in the past. There's the, there's the predictive, which is what's going to happen into the future. And there's what we study in our lab, which is uh, decision analytics, which is how do, you make the, how do you make good decisions? And this is all about solving hard SAT problems, formulating SAT problems properly, um, all this kind of thing. So, um, and I suppose a particular thing that I'm really interested in now, and I think Boole's work will have a massive impact on, is um, the analytics for sustainability. There are huge opportunities in applying optimization, applying artificial intelligence to challenges in um, uh, environmental and economic sustainability. Um, in September of this year, um, the UN launched the uh, Sustainable Development Goals, which um, there's a, a, a friend of mine uh, who's a professor in Australia, and he tells me that um, the, way to, the way to write your next grant application is look at the Gartner hype curve and pick any two things on the way up and put them together. Now, it doesn't quite work because there was a point where big data and nano were on the same size. So I don't think there's ever going to be a big nano thing. You know? But, um, but the, uh, there's a huge opportunity for doing work here, though, seriously, um, so, which tackle problems that are massive in scale um, and involve some very, very smart solutions. So, so just skipping ahead, what some of these might look like, so these are projects that we're working on. We've developed lots of this kind of stuff using vision systems to do image analysis for forestry to understand how many, how many trees are there, what kind of trees there are, what the biodiversity is in the forest, doing this all from an image. And from that then optimizing, well, for given demand for wood products, where in the world should, should they be felled? How should they be delivered? Who's going to do this? To what sawmill do they go? These are typical kind of examples. You've seen the whole Google flu trends kind of idea. Um, so using Twitter information for um, looking for spikes in uh, Nova virus and flu. Colleagues of ours in, in, um, in upstate New York have been looking at um, a system from Manhattan that analyzes tweets and based on social both social and geotagged information can give you advice as to what, the likely what is the likelihood that you've been exposed to a certain condition during the last couple of days, which is really fascinating. Um, we're doing lots of work now on um, smart transport systems, Uber, carpooling, all these sorts of things. They rely on smart analytics, smart decision making, the solving of large and um, large bo booleanly modeled, if I can make up a word, uh, problems and, and solving those. There's lots of opportunities for doing very, very simple things, taking sensors and putting them into uh, the inhalers of, asthma, of asthmatics linked to phones to measure, um, um, measure air quality. Um, and I suppose there's a, another dimension to this entirely, which is we should not forget that a huge, amount, a huge population of, the, of this planet have no data at all. Not only do they not have access to data, their own data isn't, rec isn't recorded. There are huge populations of people where their births and their deaths are not, mar are not even recorded, right? So um, this, is some work, this is a quote from um, Michael Elias um, uh, uh, that describes this, this very problem. And I suppose at, at, at a, a workshop we ran in Addis Ababa last July, um, Jacob Liu, who um, was then, and I believe still is, the US Treasury Secretary, was framing 
um, the addressing of the sustainable development goals as the task for data analytics and for data science, mathematics, and computer science. And he was saying that these are the technologies that are going to deliver those solutions. And I think that was very, very powerful. So I think um, maybe in 10 years' time when I come back if, uh, to give a talk like this, we'll be pointing out the impact that George Boole had on solving sustainable, sustainable development problems. And that would be very exciting. Thank you very much.